This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. At least 29 killed in landslide caused by heavy rain in Kenya. WHO sounds alarm on Ebola due to Congo insecurity. And this heightened security as Hong Kong gears up for local elections seen as a key indicator in the city's divided politics. Hello and a warm welcome to Africa Live. Coming to you from Nairobi, I am Penina Karibia. Also lined up tonight. It was Pomp and Kala at Nigeria International Cultural Expo. And in sports, the iconic Kalami race truck comes alive this weekend after a 37-year hiatus. We begin in Kenya, where the death toll from landslides in the northwest of the country has risen to at least 29 after more bodies were recovered. Many people are believed to be trapped in the affected villages, and the government has deployed rescue personnel to prevent further loss of lives. CGTN's Will Christian Yabo has more. Hours after the downpour stopped, raging floodwaters told the tale of a night of tragedy. As residents of West Pokot County in Kenya's northwestern region slept on, the skies opened, leading to landslides and wreaking havoc. It rained for over 12 hours, starting yesterday at 4, 4 p.m. By the time people were discovering at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, this is what you can see, that the, uh, the river has come from Pokot south. Carried floods never seen before, homes were covered. By afternoon, at least 29 people were confirmed dead. Those numbers are expected to rise as families search for missing persons. Families were covered, life, homes. People were sleeping, seven kids in one home covered and their parents had gone at night for a prayer uh, meeting only to come, they couldn't leave because it was raining. At the time they were discovered the morning, all the kids were born. Many people are believed to be trapped in the affected villages with bridges swept away and roads cut off. Local leaders have appealed for help in coordinating rescue efforts. In response, Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta has ordered the deployment of resources, including rescue personnel from the Kenya Defense Forces and the special programs to the affected regions until the situation normalizes. He also urged these forces to move communities in flood and landslide prone areas to safer grounds. In the affected areas, authorities continue to work with speed, racing against the dark clouds gathering in the sky once more. Now we spoke earlier to a local journalist in the affected area about the ongoing rescue and recovery efforts. Take a listen. Uh, so far, 15 bodies have been recovered at Nyarukulian village in Pokot South Sub County, West Pokot County. And 22 people are still missing, making a total of 37 people being feared to be dead in the area. So far, four, seven members from one family are feared dead. Okay, the security team and the Kenya Red Cross Society are on the ground trying to retrieve back the bodies which are buried in the, during the, the, the at night yesterday. On to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where militias have intensified attacks in the eastern city of Beni. More than 20 people have been killed in separate attacks in recent days. They include civilians and government soldiers. The assailants belong to a Ugandan Islamist group known as the Allied Defense Forces. The killings have provoked protests from residents accusing peacekeepers of not stopping rebels in the North Kivu province. The rebels have been operating in the region since 1995. They are blamed for thousands of civilian deaths. The United Nations says it's doubling its efforts to fight the armed group. Now, the ongoing violence in the DRC has put about 360 people at potential risk of Ebola after they came in contact with an infected person in eastern Congo. The patient has since died from the virus. The World Health Organization says ongoing violence is making it hard to track these people. 
There's panic in Oicha in the North Kivu province after a male driver died of Ebola. He had visited three healthcare centers before his death. Many other drivers also handled the body at the funeral. That one case has generated over 360 contacts, um, uh, which is a large number of contacts for any case. And that was a community death, so we know that that person was highly infectious at the moment of death. That's why we're so concerned. It's, you know, you see us before when we were having a 150 cases a week. Why are we so concerned about one case? But at this stage in the outbreak, one case matters. One case can reignite this whole outbreak. The WHO is now urging the government of DRC to enable aid workers access all areas. Civilians have been fleeing the region due to insecurity. Uh, we believe we have the resources on the ground from a public health operations point of view to end the Ebola outbreak. The, the difficulty we collectively face at the moment is just when we need that uh, unlimited and unfettered access to communities. We've lost that access in key areas, and this is a very dangerous and alarming development in this response. These developments come just over a week after the WHO approved the first ever vaccine against the disease. I don't believe we're going to see an explosive transmission of Ebola just because of this incident. What I'm highlighting is the fact that we're so close to finishing that if we lose this opportunity, we're going to be dealing with that reality for months to come. There have been 3,298 Ebola cases, including 2,195 deaths since the outbreak was declared in August 2018. Chom Hono, CGTN. Now in Hong Kong, authorities are gearing up for what they hope will be peaceful district council elections on Sunday. More than 600 polling stations will be open for over 4 million registered voters. The local government says it will do all it can to hold the voters scheduled, but is also concerned about the threat of violence. Officials say there will be a strong police presence at the ballot boxes to prevent disruptions and to give voters a sense of security. However, they say they have already relocated five polling stations due to safety concerns. Earlier, our reporter James Pellman visited the polling stations. Hi, good day, hello. As Hong Kong District Council elections approach, hello. Hi, hello. candidates in the Broadwood hello. constituency hello. are out campaigning hello. side by side. Hi, good day. They hope. The council doesn't make laws, hello. it mostly deals with local hello. neighborhood issues. Hi, hello. But these elections are now seen as a referendum hello. on the ongoing protests and the government's response. Paul Che is a pro-government candidate. There have been so much violence and disruption and vandalism, and people are voting whether they want to have a more stable Hong Kong or whether, in fact, they still want to have continuous, you know, uh, infighting among ourselves. Arthur Young is an opposition candidate. I think the vote is to, um, is to vote for a more justice uh, or a more fair system in Hong Kong. The protests and riots led some to call for postponing the voting. The police plan to beef up security, and both sides are hoping for a safe election. I'm confident about the safety and the, legit, uh, and the legitimacy about the, about the polling, um, the vote, because uh, I think Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a civilized society, and everyone thinks that this is important. Poll workers are preparing voting centers and setting up mock polling places to help the public know what to expect. Voters will line up according to the number on their Hong Kong identity card, then they will be given a paper ballot. It has a spot for each of the candidates that are running in that particular district. They'll then come over here where they can cast their ballot using this ink stamp in private. While still in here, they take the ballot, fold it in half to make sure that it remains secret who they're voting for, come over here and cast their ballot. Regardless of the outcome, a safe election day may help Hong Kong Hello, good afternoon. move past five months of crisis. We're trying our best to try to put everything back to normal a little bit. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Hong Kong. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a quick break. Coming up. Voters in Guinea-Bissau head to the polls on Sunday to elect president. And how an enterprising young South African is changing the way hearing impaired people communicate. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see 
Discover. Explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world. All around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Voters in Guinea-Bissau head to the polls on Sunday to elect the country's next president in an election that many hope will put an end to five years of political turmoil. More than 671,000 voters have registered to cast their vote in the poll, which is being contested by 12 candidates, including current President Jose Mario Vaz and two of at least six prime ministers he dismissed during his time in office. Candidates from the Guinea-Bissau presidential elections held final rallies in the capital on Friday evening ahead of Sunday's vote. President and candidate for his own succession, José Mario Vaz, concludes his first five-year term but hopes for an extension. I'm very happy because I will leave a legacy to Guinea-Bissau as president of the republic. During my mandate, there was no politically motivated assassinations or beatings. There was freedom of the press and freedom of speech. There was no political exile. I managed to do what no one did in 25 years in Guinea-Bissau since the country became a democracy. During my mandate, there was no coup and I am very satisfied with this. And I accept what the people will decide. <laughs> Vaz is the first president in the country's democratic history to finish a full term. Sunday's vote will pit him against old rival and former prime minister Domingos Pereira and 10 other candidates seeking to draw a line under five years of turbulence under Vaz characterized by high-level sackings and a barely functioning parliament. The children of Guinea-Bissau are tired because they don't go to school. Last year they did not go to school at all. In terms of health care, it is bad as well. Sisoko is a candidate for change. He will change everything in Guinea-Bissau. Sisoko is a worthy son of Guinea-Bissau, who came back to the country to help the people of Guinea-Bissau. In general, when people from Guinea-Bissau leave the country and make money, they never think of coming back and investing in the country. They prefer to stay elsewhere to spend their money. Sunday's vote represents a milestone of sorts for Guinea-Bissau, which has suffered nine coups or attempted coups since independence from Portugal in 1974. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Tens of thousands of Algerians marched through the capital and other towns and cities on Friday as the months-long campaign of protests gathers steam ahead of an election they demand to be cancelled. The protesters reject the planned election on December 12, saying it cannot be free or fair while the military and senior officials from the old guard of the ruling hierarchy retain power. The five presidential candidates were all senior officials under the former president Bouteflika, who stepped down in April when the army withdrew support after six weeks of demonstrations. The protesters want more figures from the ruling hierarchy to step aside end corruption and for the military to quit politics, the army regards the election as the only way to restore normalcy and escape the constitutional limbo caused by Bouteflika's departure. I think that the government is listening to its own logic. It doesn't listen to the one of the opposition or the one of the society or the one of the street. It's a peaceful protest. We went out to say no to the electoral mockery they want to impose on us, and the scandals that are busting about their candidates prove that people are right to refuse them. They are a part of the gang and they are publishing their files. People are right. We will keep protesting and we refuse the election with the same regime which destroyed Algeria. Avec les mêmes éléments de ce système qui a mis l'Algérie. 
We went out like every time to say no election with these candidates. No election. This is the only aim of our protest, day and night. No elections. <laughs> Now, Chinese business tycoon and Alibaba's founder, Jack Ma, will be in Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, on Monday. Jack Ma is scheduled to meet Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed to discuss investment on the technology sector to Ethiopia with an expected agreement to be signed. CGTN's Gurum Chala has more. Jack Ma's visit to Ethiopia is said to be significant as it would open doors for tech-related investment to make their way here. Ma will be in Addis Ababa on Monday following the invitation by Prime Minister Abi Ahmed himself. Few months back and on the sidelines of the Belt and Road Forum, Abi and Ma met in China and have discussed possible areas of cooperation. The Prime Minister had also visited Alibaba headquarters by then. While here in Addis Ababa and apart from cooperation and investment issues, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed and Chinese tech tycoon Jack Ma will ink a cooperation agreement in ICT-related fields. Ethiopia wants the deep investment involvement of Alibaba to widen its information, communication and tech sectors. Grumjala CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. An enterprising young South African is determined to change the way hearing impaired people communicate with others and interact with the outside world. Born to deaf parents, Lucky Neshidzati wanted to do something to make their lives easier. His team has come up with a smart glove, which may just do that. CGTN's Julie Shire tells us more. Lucky Nechitatsi was fortunate to be born with perfect hearing, despite having deaf parents. His struggle to communicate with them left him frustrated and angry. It was very hard for me, you know. You can imagine being with the parents who can't even talk, you know, here or, you know. Then I was then raised by my granny because of the challenge that I had in terms of communicating with my parent. Determined to find a solution, Nechitatsi and his team developed a smart glove prototype. It connects to a mobile app and uses motion sensors to translate sign language Hello. into speech. Hello. 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 Having grown Hi. up in rural Limpopo, Lucky understands that most people do not speak English. The app comes in several South African languages and also works the other way around. Me, as a hearing person who don't understand sign language through the mobile application, I can able to talk and then the system detect voice and translate in South African sign language animation so that, you know, deaf people can see what you're saying. There are four million people who are hard of hearing in South Africa. This could change how they live, work and go about their daily tasks. We want them to be independent and also for them to have privacy because when it comes to the deaf community, whenever they are consulting at the hospitals, there has to be a third party to interpret on their behalf. Something like that needs to, to stop, you know. Deaf people need to be independent. Even whenever they're consulting at the banks, they need to be independent. They need to have a privacy of their finances. To move the glove from the prototype phase into a full-scale production, a million-dollar investment is needed. Julie Shire, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. To Nigeria now, and the country has hosted an international expo for arts and culture in the capital, Abuja. The event provided a platform for China and Nigeria to come together and celebrate China Day while showcasing cultural exchange between both nations. CGTN's Chao Mgono has more. It was all pomp and color at Nigeria's 12th International Expo. Over 30 countries participated to celebrate Chinese culture. On shore were Chinese-inspired cultural expressions like music and martial arts. The performances were not by the Chinese, but local artists. Today, we've been able to celebrate with China because their hands are open to share their experience with Nigeria. And today you can all see that the Chinese government have done very well by getting Nigerian students, the youth, to imbibe their content of entertainment, which shows that the Chinese believe that they can do it and with us as a team. China has had similar events in other parts of the continent. The main aim is not only to celebrate China, but foster deeper cultural relations. First and foremost, economically it has helped to strengthen our people and today they are grateful that they are the platform to network with the whole world. 
through this. And the Chinese have been extremely very supportive and they've been very encouraging in working with us to develop one brand, the brand of unity between the two countries. Bilateral relations between China and Nigeria have grown in leaps and bounds and have reached an all-time high in recent years through cooperation in multiple areas since the two countries established diplomatic ties more than four decades ago. Chamwono, CGTN. Coming up in sports. The Econi Kalami race track comes alive this weekend with endurance racing returning after a 37-year hiatus. Would you create your legend on the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa? Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, fine. South Africa's iconic Kalami racetrack is a buzz this weekend. The world's largest intercontinental and most competitive motor challenge rolls into town, bringing the best endurance drivers from around the world. It also puts Kalami firmly back on the racing calendar, as CGTN's Julie Shire reports. The roar of GT engines fills the air over South Africa's Kalami racetrack, signaling a comeback from international motorsport. The youngest driver, 20-year-old South African Sheldon van der Linde, wasn't born when the last endurance race happened at the iconic venue in 1982. It's a super cool experience. I've always dreamed of being in DTM and especially racing here at Kalami. So for me, it's, uh, it's all a dream come true. My whole family is going to be here. My grandma and grandfather is going to be seeing me on the racetrack for the first time um, in a long time. The high-octane Kailami 9-hour has returned to South Africa after a 37-year absence. Fans here are ecstatic that they can once again be part of this international spectacle. you got the cars, you got the noise, you got the atmosphere, you got all these exhaust pipes just backfiring and coming down the straight. I mean, it's just, you can't get better than that. It kind of puts South Africa on the map, you know, so for motorsports, I think we have a better chance at pitching for things like, I don't know, bigger GT races and, uh, dare I say, Formula 1 as well. It's a good start for South Africa, so it's here, so now we know and kids can see, because I've seen it out, people around, and I see small kids being exposed to this, so the exposure is a good thing. Champion racer Christina Nielsen is among a list of 80 drivers from around the world tearing up the track, hoping to walk away with the top honours as the Intercontinental GT season draws to a close. It's the first time for a lot of people out here, including myself. And, I mean, we always enjoy going to, to a new track, so we're here to finish out the season strong, but it's an endurance race. I love endurance racing, but we all know that, you know, you need to get through every hour. It's nine hours that we need to get through. It's a really tricky track, a lot of elevation change, and um, quite, a, quite a variety of corners, uh, a bunch of blind corners as well, so I, it'll take it some time to learn, but uh, yeah, it's, I'm loving it so far. Kailami is known for its rapid surface and unforgiving bends. It will test out expert handling skills and push these mean machines to the limit as the battle for glory reaches a climax. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Jose Mourinho got off to a winning start in his first match as Tottenham.